Kia ora and welcome to the first episode of Power Up, a podcast powered by Adventure Taranaki and produced by Raw Collective. Here we celebrate the region's entrepreneurs with their trailblazing spirit and their can-do attitude. Taranaki innovators are leaving their mark on the world, but living the famous Taranaki lifestyle. I'm your host, David Downs. Taranaki is a region where the unique natural and business environments collide to create a place where people can flourish and achieve their full potential. No mai, haere mai, we welcome you to hear our enterprising future like no other. Today's guest is entrepreneur and investor Dan Radcliffe. Not to be confused with the Harry Potter actor, Dan is the founder of the world-leading volunteer travel company, International Volunteer HQ. He's a former New Zealand Entrepreneur of the Year, a member of the EY World Entrepreneur Hall of Fame, and a prominent investor in a range of businesses, both in Taranaki and around New Zealand. Dan started IVHQ in 2006. He'd recently left his graduate finance job after just three days because he could see that the likely career path and he knew that it wasn't going to be for him. So he went on a volunteer trip to Kenya and he was pretty unhappy with the service and the value for money and the poor way it was run and he knew he could do better. So International Volunteer HQ was formed. Nearly 15 years later, IVHQ has helped more than 110,000 volunteers to travel the world and make a difference. We talk about his journey starting a worldwide travel company from his family farm, the challenges in trying to revolutionise a global travel niche, selling a highly successful business, and the range of other exciting ventures he's been able to focus on now that he's out of the day-to-day running of IVHQ. Dan is a highly driven entrepreneur who's done all of this even before he's turned 40. From a farm in a place called Uditi to the glitz and glamour of the world-leading business people, Dan has achieved an incredible amount, all while staying extremely true to his roots. So tell us about IVHQ you just mentioned there. That, is that some sort of artificial insemination outfit? What what goes on? Yeah, it's um it's something we've done with cows down here in Taranaki. Oh, I can believe it. Yeah, it's gone pretty good. Yeah. No, um, a volunteer travel company. So business that I started would have been 13 years ago. Yeah. And I guess the business very simply sends people abroad to volunteer. Um, we are a business. People pay to do it. Based here in New Plymouth, but working in 54 countries around the world, I think. Well, right now, uh, yeah. about 30 something. Yeah, not that many. Yeah. And not many originating from New Zealand, maybe you're coming to New Zealand, I suppose. No, uh, but that's always been the case, though. So very much an international business. Um, we've always predominantly sent people abroad. We do yeah. have a New Zealand program, but... You know, in a good year when we were operating normally, it would probably receive around 200 people of 20,000. Yeah. And likewise, we'd usually send around 200 Kiwis abroad out of 20,000. So, right. So it's a, New Zealand is a very small part of the market. But why be based in New Plymouth then? I mean, why, why wouldn't you be based in London or in LA or somewhere, you know, bigger? Yeah, good question. Um, so, I mean, I'm born and bred here and I, I love the province. I love Taranaki. I'd... Gone to university down in Otago, done my thing, and I got a corporate job up in Auckland. So went up there as a graduate. I was a financial analyst. Well, that's what I was meant to do. Right. Um, and I headed up there and I thought, you know, I should go up there because that's what everyone else was doing as a graduate. And realized when I got there that I hated it. So, um, Like the place or the job? A uh, bit of both. bit of both, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Taranaki boy gets in the big smoke, realizes it's not oh, for him. It's, it's a lot of cars. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, quit the job on my third day. And rung mum and dad and told them I was coming home to the farm. I mean, they were delighted, were they? Do you know they what? They just cleared out the spare room. <laughs> <laughs> they, you would have thought, like, I always say this, like mum and dad were very supportive and you would have thought that after having me go to university for five years and putting me through boarding school to try and give me a good education to quit my first proper job after three days, um, you would have thought they would have thrown a fit, but they're actually very supportive. And yeah, I think Dad was probably actually looking forward to a bit of free labour on the farm. So. Oh, that's good. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good outcome for him. But yeah, I mean, that, you'd obviously been coming back and forth during the holidays of university and things like that, and kept in touch with the farm life, etc. Yeah, and that's and that was sort of you know I'd always loved the farm. I I, I got back to the farm there with Mum and Dad. And I sort of thought it'd be a good place to base myself for a couple yep. of months while yep. I worked out what I wanted to do. And I realised while I was there, I actually really enjoyed being home as such in the in the region. That's sort of how I got. Where back. is the farm? It's in uh, Uruti, which is. About 45 minutes north of here. I was hoping you were going to say you're a tea because then I was going to say, nah, you're a tea. Huh. <laughs> That's what we always used to say when we drove through there. It was like our little joke. Oh, okay. you know, but you pronounce it correctly. Thank you. Yeah, no, I've, I've, been, I've been trying to get better. That's good. Good on you. Go back to IVHQ. So you, you came back after three days of the corporate life. So basically you are you know, a corporate executive, really. Yeah, I've had and, a big career. Yeah, big career in the, in the big smoke. Came back as a successful graduate of that and decided to set up a travel company. Oh, there's a big step missing. 
So I was working with Dad on the farm, and I sort of, I always call this, like, I guess, my quarter life crisis. So I was 21 or 22. I just got this good job, and I'd quit, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And here I was working back with Dad on the farm. I thought, you know, there must be something more to this. I need to work out what I'm going to do in life. Yeah. So I thought about times that I'd, I guess, learned a lot about myself or decided, you know, that uh, pivotal moments when I'd taken, you know, gained confidence or taken a new direction. And there were times that I'd been challenged personally. So I started thinking while I was working with Dad, like, what, what could I do that was going to, you know, really throw myself out of my comfort zone? And I was watching the news one night and I saw some people volunteering in Africa. And I thought, you know what? That's really left field. Yeah, Never been to Africa. It looks bloody daunting. And not the sort of person that volunteers. You know, that was, wasn't really in my DNA. I'll go to Africa and volunteer for three months. Jeepers. Just out of the blue. I'm one of those people. If I make a decision and I want to do something, I usually go and do it, which yeah. isn't always the best because sometimes you can make rash decisions. Uh, <laughs> and then you're stuck with it. Yeah. yeah. But oh, this I, was a good one. Yeah, this was a good one. I started researching online, and I guess I was pretty naive at the time. I thought I'd go online, find someone, that, yep, they'd throw me on a plane, pay for me to go to Africa, pay for my meals and accommodation for three months and send me home again. All right. So I was pretty, I guess, again, I was just naive and I was really surprised to find that it was going to cost me money to do this. Yeah. And not only that, it was bloody expensive. So it's on top of the airfares, you, you were having to pay someone to set up the experience for you, basically. Yeah, yeah. 100%. So they, you had these companies online. I started the World Wide Web was in full swing by then. And you had these companies that were anywhere from, say, 3000 US dollars was the cheapest. That was yep. the company that I went with. Up to about fifteen grand US for that period of time, wow. which was extortionate. You know, I, I I always remember I had mates going off to do their con tiki and whatnot in Europe at the same time, and they were paying comparable sums for um for like a twenty one day bus tour through all the sites of Europe. Oh, or longer. Or whatever, and yeah. I was going, to, I was literally going to live in a mud hut and teach at a school. Wow! I paid this money because I was nervous about going. And I was worried about, uh, you know, someone not being at the airport to pick me up. And you see, you know, rightly or wrongly, most of the stuff you see on TV around Africa, it's not too good. Yeah. And so, again, a small small boy from Taranaki, I was a bit worried about what it was going to actually be like. And I wanted that reassurance that it was all well organised. Did you get your $3,000 worth? Well, I did, but through good luck as opposed to good management. Right. Yeah, I jumped on the plane, headed over there, and... You know, the reason I'd paid all this money was for that support and got there and lo and behold, there's no one there to pick me up at the airport. Oh. In the middle of like... This was in Nairobi. Nairobi. Yeah, so yeah. big, busy airport, different language spoken. Yep. yep. Um, little country boy just arrived from Uruti and but found a payphone because I didn't have a cell phone with me at the time. Yeah. Uh, they weren't as prevalent back then. Rang the company, they came and picked me up after a couple of hours, apologised profusely. And then took me into town and took me to the family who I was going to be staying with. Or well, took me out to the countryside, sorry, to the family I was going to be staying with. Got out there and surprise, surprise, they didn't know I was coming either. Oh, oh, this is not starting out yeah, well. Yeah, so, I, you know, I was, I, again, I'd been really naive about this, but, you know, in the build-up I'd been sitting at home and I sort of had this vision of Dan, the great white saviour, jumping on a plane and heading over to Africa to teach these kids. And yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you get over there and you're a bit, jet lagged and a little bit homesick and everything's daunting and you're like, gee, but they didn't even know I was coming. So, yeah. so you know, you probably guessed that the next morning I'd get up and go to school and the school didn't know I was coming either. <laughs> you sure you got the right plate? <laughs> oh, mate, you, you would have thought so. And so I had this, despite all of that, I had this incredible experience, but it was really through good luck over good management. The yeah. company was incredibly disorganised. I'd paid a small fortune, but I, I loved every minute of it. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, there's a, I hadn't gone there to try and start this type of company, but I, th I thought there's a real opportunity here to try and do this better. You know, it's cost me a fortune and it's been done really poorly. And not only that, finance had been my major at university, but you didn't need that to know or to do a, a basic cost analysis and realise yeah. there was a huge margin involved. Right. We knew what the family were being paid. We knew what the meals were costing. We knew how much the school was receiving. We said we could do some rough numbers or right. we thought there's the staff a big were being bit in the paid. middle. That someone's taking. Yeah, so that was, um, I started having this idea that if you could create this company where you'd work with a local organisation in each country, so let's use Kenya as the example, and Kenya would work with a Kenyan organisation, they'd provide all the meals, accommodation, the placements, and if you provided them some, I guess, Western training around customer service and how to look after people. Oh, and how to pick up people from the airport on time. There's a thing over there they could refer to as African time. It's like a meeting that's scheduled to start at 9, might start at 9 or it might start at 12. And unfortunately, a lot of the time they use that with their airport pickups, um, ah. which, you know, I was okay. But 
you get um, someone that's more nervous and, you know, most of the people who are traveling are young females yeah. out of America, quite often, you know, frantic parents. And if that happens to them, you know, you're really in it. So, yeah, they're going to they're gonna feel much more worried and insecure, et cetera. Oh, yeah. So there's so you need to get that stuff right. So, I mean, that's the basic business model, isn't it, here? You, you are providing security and peace of mind as uh, much as you are the logistics. 100%. Like you wanna, you, you're you providing exactly security and peace of mind to people and also I'd say a guarantee around that the actual experience, you know you, what your accommodation is going to be and you know that you're, that the project is going to be worthwhile because it's been sourced by local people. Yeah. So that was when I thought if you could do this and then and you could set up a pricing structure where you charge a fee that comes to you as the company. We call it a registration fee. It acts like a deposit. And then a program fee, which we received, but we passed it entirely on to the local team and country. Right. Then you could solve all of these issues that I'd had with the trip that I'd had, which was A, cost. You could make it a lot more affordable. Yeah. B, transparent. C, you'd see where the money was going. So you'd feel better about that as a traveler and a volunteer. And C, hopefully, if you did your job right and the local team did their job right, you should solve the issues around the experience. Yeah, good. So that was this, I guess, you know, people call it their light bulb moment. And that's yeah. what I had when I was over there in, in Kenya. Fantastic. So you came back on the plane, went back to the parents' farm and said, right, I've got a new idea. Yeah, clear the kitchen table. I need it. I'm doing some planning. Yeah, and it was. Um, <laughs> I went back home full of you know gusto, and I was you know ready to do this. But I got home, and I um, I guess it suddenly sort of sunk in. You know, what, how was I going to do this? I was by this stage, I was uh, 22. Again, I just quit my job the year earlier. I had no professional experience. I had no money. I had money. Oh, yeah, those three days. Come on, don't put yourself down. <laughs> goes a long way. I had, at, this, at that time, I owed mum and dad, I think, about 15 grand from this trip. So I had no finances to get the thing started. So it made me think, how was I going to do this? And I, um, the first step was going to mum and dad with cap in hand and saying, i got this idea, but you're going to need to let me borrow some money against the farm to get it started. Wow. Which is, uh, again, you, you know, I think most parents would probably, especially when I told them the idea, it's going to get people to pay to volunteer overseas. Most parents would kick you up the backside and send you back up to Auckland to ask for that job back. But <laughs> again, they were very supportive, took me into the bank, I signed up a $20,000 mortgage against the farm and away we went. So let's give them a name for a start, mum and dad, because I mean, they sound like pretty remarkable people. We deserve to hear a bit more about them. Sue and Spence. So Sue and Spence. <laughs> Tell us a little about them. Have, have they always been farmers in the Uriti area or have, have they been in business themselves apart from that? So mum and dad met in the wool shed. Uh, dad was a sharer and mum was a rousy. Mum was, nice. was a rousy on their school holidays and I think dad saw the opportunity and took it. Um, so. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, behold, here's dad. <laughs> it was actually quite funny. I think one of the reasons mum was so big on the idea of me doing this business is she'd she always said it. She always regretted. She went to university. She did a um, double major in languages, and then she f- met dad in the wool shed and uh, moved back to the farm. And I think she regretted, you know, not using that her education that she had got in, in something in a more professional field. So, I think that was probably one of the reasons they were. Well, she was so supportive is that she wanted to see me like have a crack at something. And the other good thing out of it is, mum actually. Um, became one of our, well, she became the first employee of the business and she worked with the business for 10 years until we exited. Oh, that's fantastic. What, what roles did she have? Well, as I was launching the business, she had a bit of bad luck in that we were going out on the boat one day. The ocean's pretty wild here on the West Coast and she, we hit the uh, hit a wave and she broke her foot quite badly. Oh, so anyway, she ended up in hospital and she was dad's right-hand lady on the farm. So she did the drenching, you know, she yep. was helping with the mustering and spraying and everything. So... Can't have a right hand lady without a foot. No, no. She just she could she could still do the farm books, which was lucky. But she was laid up for six months. Now, just as she got laid up, I launched IVHQ and it took off. And I needed we actually needed more countries open, so I'd jump on the plane and go over to find these countries. And I'd set up Mum with a laptop on the um, kitchen table, and she'd answer the inquiries for me. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah. So she she went from that. She went into inquiries. Now, Mum was. She's almost OCD in the sense that she used to want to stay on top of the inquiry. So, right, something comes in, she's onto it. Yeah, solve it, fix it. Problem is, most of our customers are based overseas, so that you know the inquiries are coming in at two or three in the morning. And I'd be overseas, and I'd see her replying to these in Gmail, and I'd be like, "It's four a.m. What's she doing?" Wow. Um, so she got really into it, a little bit too into it. So we eventually had to take her off that. <laughs> Except in quiet word well, about we work-life balance, mum. <laughs> yeah, mum, you're off the inquiries and we're going to put you on. She'd always done the books for the farm. So she went into the um, 
Well, the finance division, which was her. Did you give her a good title, <laughs> like vice president of finance or chief financial officer or something? Uh, head of finance. Head of finance. There you go. Yeah. Good. So. In lieu of wages, you get a great job title. <laughs> it's a good deal for you, Mum. Well, no, she went on the payroll after the first year. Oh, okay, good. So she was, um, yeah, she was a paid employee after year one, but she worked, yeah, for free for the first year. Nice. Yeah. So she was head of finance for the rest of the time in the business. You're a year in, things are starting to really tick along and go well. You've hired more than just your mum now. You've probably got your cousin and your auntie Edna. So tell us about that growth phase, because that must have been a really exciting time. Yeah, it was. We um we launched the business in August or late July 2007. So the first year we were at home on the farm. I didn't have enough money. I was, again, I still had mum and dad a, a bucket load from starting the business and this trip overseas. So I had to live with them for a year, which I always said was my big sacrifice that I made to, oh, get, to get the business. I well, bet you got lovely dinners cooked for no, you every I, day. I genuinely did. You, I got meals cooked all the time, but yeah. I still had to help dad during the day because I still needed some, you know, I had to earn a little bit of a wage because I wasn't making any money for a start. Yeah. But for a start, mum and dad wouldn't let me put the, um, we got no mobile phone reception at Urity. Ah. And we've also, um, we only had dial up internet there. So for the first year, in terms of launching an online business, it wasn't textbook. <laughs> but um, A dial up internet online business. Oh, mate, well, not, well, not anymore, obviously, back yeah, then, yeah. this is 13 years ago. Yeah. Um, but one of the big issues we had for a start is I, I needed a phone number. And obviously with no mobile phone reception, I couldn't put my cell phone on there. But mum and dad wouldn't let me put the home phone on either because they didn't want people ringing up all the time. Yeah, at three in the morning. Yeah, exactly, which was kind of fair. So I, I had to put our <laughs> phone number, well, my phone number on. But what it meant is that one of the biggest issues I had in that first year was I'd work at home during the day of dad on the farm, then I had to drive out to Urunui, which is about oh, 15 minutes away, yeah. to where I could get some reception to pick up my messages that night and then go home and make these calls during the evening. So you so might you call get, people back again that left your messages oh, during mate, the day. So you might get home and I'll, you might oh, get out God. there and I've got four calls and I've got one from Germany, one from Australia, a couple from America, and I'd write them in my notebook as to work out where they are and then go home. And some of them I'd be able to make that night and then others you might have to set the alarm for certain times. Yeah. I used mum and dad's phone back then. Do for, they know that? No, the, they the, don't. So, oh. I think they probably do now because I've told a few people that story. But it's pretty, yeah, I can imagine, you know, because you were in the hole by $35,000 by my reckoning, but now you're starting to put long distance calls on there. You're going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> mum, mum's pretty good with the numbers too. She would have seen that happening. Yeah. Um, Daniel, can you please explain this $35 charge? <laughs> So obviously the business just kept growing and growing until the point where you could get an office in town or yeah, so move that, into professional premises. It was almost one year in, and we um, we decided to move to the big smoke to New Plymouth, and that was I think you know you talked before about why do you base it down here? That was sort of the pivot with do we go somewhere bigger or do we look to stay here and keep it in Taranaki? Yeah. It looked like it had real legs, and one of the biggest decision making factors for me was just purely cost. I looked at it at the time, and I was still living at home at that stage so you know money was still pretty tight and yeah. the cost of actually getting a place in New Plymouth and the cost of employment in New Plymouth yeah. and this is something that still holds true today for us you know we've got offices in Auckland and New Plymouth yeah. and it's a no-brainer in terms of hiring if we can get the right people here we always hire here yeah. so that, that was one of the factors and the other reason was that I just loved the um, I loved the place I grew up here and I you know it was a really good lifestyle to diving and you know, fishing you could get out and go back to the farm easily it was um, had good yeah. mates here so so we in and the plan was to get this proper office, but I actually saw at the time that you could get in a um, there was an apartment for sale in town. So I bought this apartment, and uh, did you buy it or did your mum and dad buy it? Come on, let's be honest here. <laughs> well, no, by that time I actually had an, I actually oh, you had some money. I had, okay. I, had, I had enough for a small deposit, mm. so I um, I bought this apartment, which became the um, the IVHQ offices for the first five years. So nice residential apartment. I'm I'm pretty sure it was okay, but we moved the team out of there at about year six when we had about. For the first six years, I had only female employees, right. and we had about seven ladies coming and going out of the, the supplement um, <laughs> every day. So at that point, I think the neighbours were starting to get concerned. Sure, what, what sort of business are you running? Yeah, yeah, what's actually happening downstairs? Yeah. So yeah, moved, moved there that year. Um, got our first proper employee. That wasn't my mother. Yeah. And we uh, yeah worked out of this apartment. So the the biggest issue we had in that first year was we'd, we'd launched with four countries. So. With that money that I borrowed, I went back to Kenya where I had an organisation. Then I had to do a bit of cold calling. So I knew I looked, did some research online and found Vietnam, Thailand, and Nepal. Yeah, I decided those were three. Looking at which what other companies were doing, those were three pretty popular destinations. Yeah. And then I flew back there and basically had to go door knocking. So I looked on the the depths of Google, page ten, found um, organisations that were doing 
either volunteer travel or something very similar. Yeah. And then would go to them with this proposal around this company that I wanted to start. So you sort of must almost turn up out of the blue and say, I'm from New Zealand, I'm setting up this business. Do you oh. want to work with me? They knew I was coming, yeah. but that's, I always say this was by by far the hardest part of getting this business off the yeah. ground, was going there with no website at the time. You know, we don't we hadn't quite launched yeah. and actually pitching this idea of what we were trying to do. Yeah. And not only that, because there had been all these inflated prices around volunteer travel, people were expecting to get paid a fortune. Ah, okay. So we basically had to say, listen, we want you to be our partner. We want to send people to you. We want you to do it for a third of the cost that you're currently doing it. And don't worry, we haven't got a website, but we can definitely send you people. Yeah. Like the reality is we went to these three countries and I think I'd ranked all the the organizations that I wanted to work with from one through to five. And I think we got one of the top ones that we wanted. Yeah. The other two countries, we ended up with number three because the others just weren't, you know, willing to have a bar of us. Yeah. The great news story out of that was out of those three countries, we ended up working through with them for 10 years and they... You know, I think at the time the Thailand organization was receiving around 30 people a year. You know, within seven years of working with us, we were sending four to 500 people to them. Fantastic. Yeah, which was a really cool story and something really nice to see, you know, how those organizations drew alongside us. So that's a revenue stream for them, but also obviously doing great work then, you know, because what these volunteers are doing is having an impact on the local communities. Amazing. And this organization was called Mirror up in um, northern Thailand and it really did transform that area. So a huge amount of social issues up there with... um, In Chiang Mai sort of area. Yeah, exactly. Chiang Mai is with trafficking between countries and drug trade and a lot a lot, of, a lot of these issues that filter through to the families and the amount of work that our volunteers were able to do out there was really, really cool. And to see that over a period of time was, um, yeah, was really awesome. Fantastic. So what about the customer side of it? How were you, without a website, how were you getting the volunteers through the door or, you know, the virtual door and onto the plane? Uh, well, we, we did have a website by the time we launched. So okay. I always say launch day was the day the website went live. We used a company up in Auckland, an agency who we worked with for the first eight years of the business, uh, Spark Interactive. They were oh, okay. re- really good, yeah. good guys. They became good friends and they were a huge part of our success. So yeah. we got the website live and um, – I always said that it would be the website would be the making or breaking of the business. You know, we were yeah. we chose the name International Volunteer HQ because I thought it sounded large and brand. Yeah, and it, you didn't Big corporate headquarter feeling. Oh, thing. Yeah, you didn't want people knowing it was just Dan yeah, and his yeah. mum working at the family Dan farm. Dan and his mum's family farm holidays. <laughs> no, it's not quite the same ring to it. <laughs> but there must have been a few setbacks on the way though, because it's you know every time I hear you talk, I'm amazed at the growth of your business. But I'm sure there were setbacks on the way. Things didn't go well. Challenges with suppliers, challenges with some of the projects, perhaps. The first 10 years, which is where I was CEO, you yeah. know, we had some pretty big challenges. I think probably the biggest one that springs to mind is we, um, the Kenyan organization who we worked with, their owner or their CEO, the founder, James, um, became a really good friend. But in the third year, and he was the, you know, that was a big program for us three years in. So, even though at that stage we had about 10 countries we were working in, we were probably sending, I'd say, 30% of them to Kenya. And then we got a phone call one night and he'd been killed in a car hijacking. Oh, man. Um, and he was, you know, literally, he was the lizer of that business. So it's a real litmus test for how people for us people to jump behave. on a plane yeah. and go live there for three months just to help the team get through it and make sure that we could very put in place a succession got, you know, plan and have staff and that could step up. And got a good plan in place. That really um, rocked us as a business. Across across so that local team does what it says it should. And it was also, I think, and there will be need then. I mean, IVHQ will have an even more model coming out of COVID. Yeah, I think so. It'll be really interesting. I think one of the You've things got all these that we're still trying to understand a little bit as well as the state of that you've talked to them about and all these steps you take, but I think you see all the news. It's a bit theoretical, you know, is it? Until uh, something yeah, until something like that happens, you, yeah. so, so I think you, your comment you know, there is you're 100% right, it's going to be a really yeah. interesting yeah. place. And so hopefully when people are traveling, they're traveling in, you know, Probably the other big challenge that we found is just the shape that volunteer travel took over that period of time. So I started this company with some really good ideas around what we wanted to achieve and how we were going to do it. And then over the 10 years, the I'm very big on this idea that every part of what we did have became a lot more complex and complicated on doing a lot of critics out there. So I always believed I'd be a little bit ahead of the time in that respect. And, yeah. and again, there was a way for people to travel and volunteer and travel really poorly by a few yeah. companies. So, but unfortunately, yeah, I think we're it's only going to become a regardless of So the amount of work that we had to do that we're seeing the last five years around the people are going to start thinking a lot more consciously around what they're doing while they're doing good stuff and that. Yeah, the volunteers weren't doing harm that were going in there. Yeah. Um, you know, it was uh, yeah, it was huge. But it also, I think, 
we stopped working with orphanages two years ago, which I still feel a bit, a bit sad about. We Just because it's too complex, not because the need doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. I still really feel really strongly the need does exist. You know, we had some local teams that were incredibly upset about it, that lost volunteers that were, you know, they were the revenue, they were the help for those orphanages. But unfortunately, it became such a complex PR exercise that a lot of people just didn't want to associate yeah. themselves with it. It's you know, easier to step away than to, than to fight the fight, I guess. And that touches on something I was going to ask you about. You, you've obviously employed people who are very cause-driven then, and you personally must get really attached to some of the individual projects and causes and and think about, you know, you're flying in as a volunteer, you're doing a month or so and you're coming out again, but you're leaving behind poverty and deprivation and inequity. And How do you deal with the emotional trauma and how does your team deal with that sort of thing? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, it's just, and it's something that is probably one of the reasons I wanted to also start IVHQ is I grew really attached to the the Kenyan community that I was with for those three months. But there's a, I guess there's a big part that's not really talked about. Well, and we didn't even used to talk about it that much, which was the you know reverse culture shock. It's yeah, it's not going to Kenya. It's actually coming, it's coming back, back again. It's coming back again and having it's, like the, it's all noisy and there's traffic and it's all a bit weird and yeah, too privileged. Exactly. So one of the things that we used to do little bits about it in terms of the briefing would give people. But one of the things that I started four or five years ago now was a company called Global Travel Academy. What we were finding is people were heading away and they weren't skilled up enough or they weren't considering enough, despite everything we were trying to do around um, the briefings we were giving them, around considering the impact that they were making and the reasons why they were volunteering, but also thinking, okay, what about when I'm coming home? How do I how do I readjust? How do yeah. I make sure that I'm, you know, that I'm... So go, go back to life as normal because it won't be. Exactly. Yeah. So we started this, another company called the Global Travel Academy, whose purpose is to basically make sure that we educate volunteers in that space around going there and becoming, being a good volunteer, making sure they're taking photos responsibly. If they're posting online, they're thinking about how they're posting and why they're doing it. Yeah. And even a more basic level, thinking about why are they wanting to do this? Why are they wanting to be a volunteer? Is it because they want to pad their CV? Or is it because they want to give back? And a lot of those questions, I mean, you can, there's different levels of projects. And so if someone just wants to pad their CV, then we can go and find a project yeah, for them. Yeah, some nice easy ones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But if there's someone that's actually going over there to make a real difference and they're able to give nine months of their time and you know they're serious about it then we can actually find good projects too so part of this the thing here on this course was that if we can educate our volunteers and get them thinking about being a good volunteer before they leave then it's going to be a far more positive experience for them but also for the local community Hey, Dan Radcliffe, thank you so much for coming in. That is awesome. You are the entrepreneur par excellence. Some people would call you the Elon Musk of Taranaki. Oh, Jeffers, he's mad, isn't he? Well, <laughs> look in the mirror, pal. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Cool, thank you.